Matthew chapter 7 is where we're at. One of the consequences of being in a relationship with God, of his life being evident in you, is that he says you will be salt and light to the world. That just by the very nature of him indwelling you and you walking daily in in obedience to him you're going to shine the the way of truth I mean you don't have to try it's just going to inevitably happen intrinsic to your new relationship you're also going to confront sin you know that's what that side of it often gets believers into trouble because we we compromise and we don't confront sin we don't serve that salt function but he says that the natural consequences of being in a relationship with God is that you are salt and light now one of the things one of the responses that the world has just non-believers have to believers as we perform this this duty of salt and light is that they reach into the Bible and pull out a Bible verse and they slap us about the face with it. And this is verse here in Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 that we've already read this morning. Judge not lest you be judged. So you're at work and this man comes to you and he, he says, you know what, last week Betty and I went out and we had a great time, spent the weekend up at, you know, the lake and had a great time and oh, it was just marvelous. And you look at him and say, isn't your wife's name Sue? <laughs> and he says, judge not, lest you be judged. You know, they turn that verse around and, and, and employ it in such a way that we're not supposed to judge you know even believers will take this verse and and will say that oh well we we shouldn't judge other people well the problem with doing that is there are a host of verses that ask us to judge you can look through your Bibles, you can see some over in the Gospel of Matthew, you see over in, in Galatians where Paul talks to the church there, and you can see where John writes in 1 John about confronting a brother in sin. So, there are times when we're supposed to judge. So how does the idea of this statement about not judging and our common misconception about what it means... How does that apply to our role as salt and light and the responsibility that we have to call out sin? I think it goes to the way in which we employ it. Okay? We're going to walk through this verse here, or this chapter here, very quickly, but let, let me kind of put it in this context. Whenever you and I see sin, we beset the person. How you like that word beset? <laughs> sounds sounds Bibleish, doesn't it? Beset. We get on them. We get in their face. We thump them with the Bible, and we call their very person into question. You're just a sinner. Okay, you're a bad person. Rather than going to them in the way that I like to think of seeing somebody in danger. You're walking along one day along the street and you, you see you see some little kid chasing his ball out into the street and, and, and you, you're, you're witnessing this. What do you do? Get popcorn, stand there and wait for the accident. I'm going to talk to the cops because I saw it all. What are you going to do? You're going to stop the kid? What else? Run out in the street? Scream, holler, wave your hands. Something, right? You're going to call out to this child who is in danger or to the person that's in danger of striking this kid. That is the biblical concept of confronting sin. As you see somebody in danger and you address the issue out of concern for the person. That's the biblical position. 
And it is our practice of attacking the individual that Jesus is talking about here. Because you've got to keep in mind, before you ever come to this verse, you've got to keep in mind the Jewish practice of the day. You remember one time Jesus was talking to, his, talking to his disciples about prayer. And he said, when you pray, you know, this is how you ought to pray. And he says, don't pray this way. Like the Pharisee did. Oh Lord, I thank you that I tithe of my money. And I thank you that I'm so good. And I thank you that I'm not like this scoundrel tax collector over here. Remember that? I mean... He's attacking the person. This is the practice of the religious leaders of their day. Not warning the people who are of value about a danger, but belittling, berating, and attacking the individual, calling their worth into question. Jesus is countering that here. So when he says to these people, do not judge... He's not saying you have no responsibility to call out sin. He's not saying you have no responsibility to define truth because by your very nature, as salt and light, you're going to do those things. What he's saying is do not judge that individual. I was at dinner one night. And I was talking with this couple. And inevitably, it seems like in this day, the discussion turned to politics. And this woman says to me, Barack Obama's evil. And I said, really? You know him? Oh, no. Well, I said, you can't say he's evil. Well, yes, I can. No, no, you can't. And yeah, you can guess kind of where it went from there. Yes, can. No, it can't. Yes, can. No, it can't. I said, I'm not disputing that some of the things are evil or bad or disagreeable. I'm not disputing that. I said, but you cannot say, this lady's a believer. I said, you cannot say he is evil. You don't know him. You don't know his heart. You don't know his standing before God. None of us have the capacity to know that about another person. So if you're willing to look at a person and to judge them... You need to be aware that in the same manner in which you judge them, you will be judged. But keep in mind, Jesus said, while you may notice sin in their life, you're probably oblivious to greater sin in your own life. And not only greater sin, but maybe even sin just like what they're doing. You ever notice why you can spot deception in other people so easily? Maybe it's because you're familiar with it. Think about this. You buy a car. You go to the store and you buy a car. And it's a, I don't know, it's a 2014, um, I don't know, BMW. Blue. And you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you notice all the blue BMWs on the road. And you think, everybody's following my trend. No. Those cars were there before. But now that you have one, you notice all the rest of them. We do it about a lot of things. You buy a shirt. Hey, look, so has got the same shirt. They've always had it. You just notice it now. Jesus points that, that tendency out in us. He says, you look at a little speck of material. You see it in your brother's eye. A little chip of wood in your brother's eye. But you miss the big old honking beam of the same thing in your own eye. We're familiar with sin in other people because it's sin that resides within us as well. But why is it that when sin abides in us, you and I are so quick and so easy to excuse it away? Gentlemen, I'm going to pick on you. You know why? Because you're easier and i got to go home with her. So I'm going to pick on the guys. Gentlemen, we struggle with lust. Now I want you to do something for me, guys. I want you to reach right, follow your thumb down, right to the middle part of your, uh, of, your, of your wrist. Right here, I want you to put your finger right there. You feel something? You feel a pulse? Then you lust. Okay? Just, if you're alive, I'm sorry. It's a deal about guys. I mean, guys just, guys struggle with lust. And you go, well, not me. Well, bless you, brother. You know? Now be honest. To some extent, every guy struggles with lust. It's just a reality. But yet we'll go, oh, 
so and so he's got a problem with lust and I want to go how do you know maybe you're familiar with it maybe you know that one or you go you know so and so they're really greedy how do you know my grandma used to put it this way birds of a feather you know you kind of recognize it that's a tendency all of us have if there's something about another person that just irks you guess what it's probably something in you I love it I love it I love it my daughter and I get into an argument and I'll talk to my wife afterwards and I'll say you know she did you and, and and she just smiles oh where did she get that she just smiles she goes you're the same way that's how we are we are inclined to spot the sin in other people so keep in mind that when you're ready to judge somebody else you're inviting God to judge you on the same basis and the odds are that well he's probably he's probably gonna he's probably gonna find that very thing in your life so if you want to go poking in somebody's eye just be ready for God to poke in yours I think it's wiser, Jesus says, I think it's wiser to be a little discerning about, about judgment. We need to be discerning about judgment. And I want you to know that there are times when you really just ought to leave it alone. Take a look at what he says. I love this verse. It kind of jumps out of nowhere. You know, he, he talks about, you know, taking care of your own, looking at your own life. And, and, and getting the log out of your own eye. See that in verse 5? And then he says, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Deal with your own issue before you beat up on your brother or your sister. But deal with your own issue and then help your brother and sister. But then he throws this in. He says, don't give what is holy to the dogs and don't throw pearls before swine or they'll trample you under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And you go, how did we go from a log to pigs? I mean, it's like talking with a teenager. You ever talk with a teenager? You know, you're standing there and you're going, so how was school today? Everything was great. Everything was marvelous. And by the way, you know, I, dogs are great. We go from school to a dog. Now, there's a connection in their mind. You just didn't notice it. Right? There's a connection here. You just don't notice it. There are times when you've dealt with this, this sin in your own life, and you see it in the life of another and out of compassion for that person you want to go and talk to them but you know what they're not ready to receive it they're not ready to deal with it you go to that person and you try to in love and in compassion to help them you're not you're not trying to beat up on them you're just reaching out to them and they're going to bite you timing's not right See, I, I carry this innate sense of right and wrong. I, I see wrong and I, you know, I kind of like want to storm hell with a water pistol and, you know, straighten things out. And you get hurt that way. You need to sometimes weigh it and say, you know what? Is this timing right? Is now the time? Because see, pigs don't appreciate pearls. You're going to throw something valuable to somebody that's not going to appreciate it. Look, pray for them. Look for a timing that is right when they're going to receive that well. You know, confronting a guy in the bar who's drunk off his keister is probably not the time to tell him he needs to get his drinking under control. Right? Lord, what's your timing? The book of Proverbs say that a word fitly spoken is like a, a setting of golden apples in a fixture of silver. Timing matters. So sometimes, let a sleeping dog lie. Don't go and talk to your husband or your wife about their anger issue when they're angry. Okay? Look for a right time. Well, what should I do then? Because believe me, I'm that way. I'm going, I see an issue. We need to attack it. Look at the next thing that Jesus kind of seems to grab out of the air that doesn't seem to fit. All of a sudden he throws out, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. 
Now we've had people that have preached whole messages, written whole books about, you know, this passage and how that, you know, we ought to persevere and seek and knock and ask and all that. And I'm not taking anything away from that. But I want you to see it in the context in which Jesus offered it. He says, you're dealing with somebody and this is a way to deal with them. Deal with them lovingly, look at your own life, and sometimes you leave them alone. Well, what do I do when I'm, when I'm leaving them alone? You pray for them. You seek, you ask, you knock. Well, what should I seek? Well, maybe you should seek a reason and an understanding. You come home today and you find out that your, your, your dog is angry at you and every time you get near him, he bites at you and all of that. You've got a choice. You can say, dumb dog, throw him outside, yell at him, scream at him, hose him down, whatever it is you do when your dog gets out of control. Or you can say, you know what? There's something going on here. What's going on with my dog? Why does my dog act this way? My dog doesn't normally act this way. And you come to find out that the dog's got an infected paw. Deal with the infected paw. You take care of the, the attitude, right? Well, maybe sometimes we need to seek. Why are people doing this? Because I want you to understand something. All behavior is intentional. It's purposeful. Everything somebody does, they do for a reason. There are very few people, unless you're demon-possessed, or unless you're brain-damaged. And I mean those seriously. Every behavior is done for a reason. People are trying to accomplish happiness. They're trying to accomplish stability in their life. I know that seems strange because there are people that chaos just seems to follow them. And you go, well, how could they be seeking stability? Because old leather is comfortable. Whether it's ripped up or not, it's comfortable. And so some people find comfort in chaos. Look for the reason. Seek the reason. If you're really concerned about the person, seek the reason. If all you're concerned about is what they're doing, then reason doesn't matter. I don't care why Linda does A or B. All I care is that she doesn't do A or B. Maybe I need to seek a reason. Why do they do that? I need to seek. Lord, give me understanding to this person. Give me understanding in this situation. Ask. You know what? How about, I mean, I know this is talking about asking God. But how about asking them? Hey, uh, brother, what's up? Instead of just coming down in the middle of their chest and saying, I've already decided what's up. Or knock. I like the idea of knocking. Knocking is a sense of persevering. I, I wouldn't talk to them one time. That's it. I'm done with them. You know, I'm through. I, I've had it up to here. How many times does God just keep knocking and persevering in our life? So I'm waiting for a time. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the person. I don't want to judge the person. I do want to call out sin. But I don't want to judge the person. They're not receptive. So what should I do? Pray, ask, seek, knock. And you know the beautiful thing it says? That if you do that, God will answer. God will answer. God will make a difference. Oh man, think about this for a moment. Think about this for a moment. You know, let, let's take your child. Because all parents, most parents, a good number of parents, some parents, <laughs> my parents did, but anyway. Parents want what's best for their kids, right? I mean, they see their kids doing something and they're really concerned about them. And, and so they go to them and they confront them in some issue. But they, they do it out of love, right? Right? And, and the kids always just amply respond in favor and grace, correct? <laughs> and so we, in, in, in nurturing love, just raise the volume and say, you got to understand I love you, and now I'm grounding you forever, you know? We do that sort of thing. I have found as a father that I have far more effectiveness in the core issue of my child's life when I pray for my child than when I try to drive my child by intimidation, by using the daddy hammer. The things that I cannot e evoke in my child's life, I find that when I pray for that child, things begin to change. That's a cool thing about being in a relationship with God is I'm not the one doing it. But God is. It's a benefit for being in a relationship. He's not telling you what to do. He's telling you how He would do if He's dealing with other people. 
So why don't you give them a chance? Why don't you pray for that person? Matter of fact, I challenge you. Why don't you pray for that person as much as you criticize that person? Oh, I'm sorry. I know. None of you ever criticize anybody, right? I'll confess to that one. Take a look at verses 15 and 16. Or 13 and 14, I'm sorry. He says, don't judge the people. Take a look at your life. Be wise about your timing. Invoke prayer in the situation. But also keep this in mind. That doing the right thing is hard. See, Fred, I told you, your amen this morning is the only one I was going to get. Okay? Doing the right thing is hard. It really is. Not being critical is hard. Not, not, not picking at somebody is hard. Not calling, you know, uh, a guy a, a class A nozzle when he pulls out in front of you, like happened to me yesterday, um, and I called him a nozzle. That's my sin. All right? It's hard. It's hard to live a righteous life. If anyone ever told you as a follower of Jesus that living the righteous life would be easy, I want just as gently as I can to tell you they were wrong. Okay? I've been a follower of Jesus for over 30 years. It's hard. Because there are times when people do stupid things that I just want to club them. I want to take a person and beat them with another person. I mean, it just is frustrating. It's, you see things going on and you go, Oh, can't they realize it? Well, let me ask you this question. If somebody realized what they were doing was wrong, don't you think they would not do it? Think about that. Now again, some people are mentally incapable and some people are possessed. I believe that. But most people, if they know something to be wrong, they don't do it. So if they're doing something that's wrong, odds are, they don't think it's wrong. Make sense? It's hard to live the Christian life. It's easy to live the life of whatever you want to do, whatever feels good. That's what Jesus is saying here. He says, enter through the narrow gate, but keep in mind that the narrow gate is difficult. It's a lot easier to live the broad way. Think of it this way. Think of walking a two by four, which I never would because I'd lap over way too much. So I'm going to make mine a six by eight. All right? And I'm walking this six by eight and I've got, I've got a shoulder bag in my mouth and I've got a suitcase in each hand and a bag under each arm and a duffel that I'm kicking. Now, what are the odds I'm probably going to fall off that? Probably pretty good. But if I'm walking on flat and level ground, I could do that all day. It's easy to carry that much baggage and walk the, the broad way. That's why a lot of people just go with whatever feels good. Because it's easy. It's hard to say, you know what? I shouldn't eat the wrong things. Or I shouldn't think the wrong things. Or I shouldn't do the wrong things. Or you know what, Lord? Even, even better as a follower of yours, it's difficult for me to love my enemies. It's difficult for me to turn the other cheek. It's difficult for me to speak only words of, of encouragement and blessing and not words of criticism. It's difficult to me. But I'll tell you what. He says, in the end, take a look at the last part of verse 14. Okay? It says, the gate is small, the way is narrow, that leads to life. It re it's rewarding. It's beneficial, but it's hard. It's not easy to live the Christian life. Because your natural human inclinations are going to argue against it. So you know what? Maybe you ought to cut your brother or your sister a little slack when they drop off the edge occasionally. Maybe you need to keep in mind that, you know what? Sometimes you miss the mark. So don't judge them. I'm not saying that you excuse the sin, but cut them a little slack. Because you know what? When I drop the ball, you know what I want? I want somebody to call me on it, but I don't want them to kick me while I'm down. I don't want somebody to come to me and say, you know what, Jim, you did this, and you're a jerk! But we see that, don't we? 
When I see somebody in sin, I try to show them grace and mercy. Because that's what I want from God. I don't, mar I don't marginalize their sin. Oh, it's not that big of a deal what you did. No, it's a big deal. But I want you to understand God loves you. I want you to understand I love you. That's bad. You're still loved. It's hard to live the Christian life. It's hard to do the right thing. It's a lot easier to do the wrong thing. It's a lot easier to stumble through a China store without any regard for security. Oh, yeah, look at this. Crash. It's hard to walk through paying attention to your, to your, your steps. He goes on to challenge this and he says, You see this in your life. You see the bad practice in your life. He says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. He says, You see this sort of thing. You see people who got the outside together, but who on the inside don't have anything together. Those are the religious leaders that, you, that you're dissatisfied with. That's what you witness in, in synagogue all the time. You don't like it. So if you're going to be part of the kingdom of heaven, which is this whole discourse here that he's talking about, begins over in chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, is he's talking about what it means to be in the kingdom of the heavens. He says if you're going to be in a relationship with God, he says don't act like them. Don't act like those that are ravenous wolves that are going around and acting one way on the outside and another way on the inside. He says, you've got to understand that someone is going to be known. Who they are is going to be known by what they do. It's not the other way around. I had a lady come to me one day at church and she said, my child doesn't want to come to church. I said, I'm sorry. I said, is your child a believer? And she said, no. I said, then why should they want to come to church? She looks at me. I said, I don't like soccer. Nothing personal. <laughs> he likes soccer. Okay? I just don't like soccer. It's all right. He's going to get me in the parking lot. I know it. <laughs> Should have picked another one. I don't like soccer. So you know what? I've never watched a soccer game. I've never gone to a soccer game. I couldn't tell you about a soccer game. Except that that one guy that bit the other guy. <laughs> well, that's just violence and I like violence. So what can I say? Okay, right? I mean, I don't, I don't, do, I don't do things that, that I don't like. I do things that I like. Now think about that. Just a moment. It might make you nervous. Because then you go, well, I occasionally lie. Maybe it's because you like it. Remember what I said, behavior is purposeful? We're not defiled because of what we do. Okay? The old joke, will smoking send you to hell? No, just make you smell like you've already been there. Okay? Your actions don't condemn you. Your actions don't defile you. That's what Jesus is talking about. When he confronted the Pharisees and he says, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, it's what comes out. It's not what you do that defiles you. What you do only reflects what's inside. These wolves in sheep's clothing, these, these, these grapes not being produced by thorn bushes, that's the same thought. Who you are inside is what is produced on the outside. That's more important. It's more important that you look at the person and who they are than merely on what they're doing. But we've reversed that. We think that it's important that people behave a certain way and we're not concerned about the core of their person. What makes an adulterer an adulterer? You say, well, he's committed adultery. And I would say no. At his heart, he is an adulterer. That's why he commits adultery. Well, what makes him an adulterer? He has an adulterous heart. Who we are at the seat of our being is far more important than the things that we do, good or bad. Because you know what? That's where God looks. God doesn't judge, the Old Testament tells us, like men judge. He doesn't look at the outside. He's not impressed with how well I dress, how good my diction, or anything like that. He looks in my heart and he says, what sort of person are you at the core of your being? 
Am I a person in relationship with him? My person that's seeking to walk in obedience to him? That's what God's concerned about. He's not concerned about how squared away I am. If he's concerned about how squared away I was, he wouldn't have provided the means of forgiveness. He knows I'm not squared away. He knows it's hard to live the Christian life. He knows it's hard for me to walk in obedience. So he grants the, uh, the opportunity for forgiveness. So he's looking at my heart and he's saying, Jim, where's your heart? Is your heart following me? But we don't do that. We instead judge people by their cover. What you do is who you are. Well, sometimes people appear as sheep, but really they're wolves. Take a look at verse 24. He's wrapping up the greater teaching on the Sermon on the Mountain. So what he says applies to everything he says. But it also applies to this in specific. He says, look, it's not enough that you just hear what I say. It's not enough that you just, just you know, if you will, believe what I have to say. He says you need to build your life on it. He uses that analogy. He says everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them. He can be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the events of life happened and the house stood. Or you can disregard who I am and what I say and live your own way and when the events of life happen your house will collapse. That's why I really feel no need to argue with people about the validity of Christ or about the validity of the gospel message because living it works not living it doesn't. So if somebody wants to say, hey, you know what? I, I reject Christ. I start praying for him. Give me a chance when the wheels come off. Because the wheels are going to come off. And why would I be that way? Because I'm not concerned about so much what they do. I'm not saying it doesn't bother me. I'm not saying that I, I'm not alert to it. But I try to be more concerned about who they are as a person. If I'm only concerned about what they do, I will discard them if they discard my practice or reject my faith. But if I'm concerned about them as a person, then I'll continue to pursue them through prayer, through you know, intercession, you know, through relationship, in the hopes of them coming to a point where their inner person is changed and it's manifested in their outer person. I love talking with people and they say, well, you know, I'm not much into religion. I go, me too. <laughs> and they look at me. You're a pastor. I'm not into religion. I'm really not. I get in trouble with my friends because, you know, they, they got all the tenets that you got to do. And I go, nope, mm -mm, mm -mm, nope, 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 nope. So it's all about a relationship with Christ. It comes down to whether or not you do what you believe God is having you to do. Now... Hold on a second. Don't get all excited and say, I believe God would have me to go off and rob a bank. Because the Word of God is pretty clear. It says God won't, God won't lead you to do something like that. Okay? Don't go out and do sin and say God told me to do it. It doesn't work that way. But if I walk in a relationship with God, I'm not so concerned about the rules. Remember, oh, I'm going to have to find it here real quick. Oh, there you go. Verse 12. Treat people the same way you want them to treat you. See that? But you've got to take the next part. For this is the law and the prophets. Jesus said the entire law is summed up in this thing. Treat others like you'd want to be treated. Think of them like you'd think of you. That sums up the law and the prophets. Don't worry about, you know, are they following the law and the prophets? Or whether you're following the law and the prophets? Be concerned about them as a person. If you're concerned about them as a person, as God is concerned about them as a person, and they come to a relationship with Him, guess what? They're going to live out the law and the prophets. And if you love people, guess what? You're going to live out the law and the prophets. Because you don't rob people you love. You don't kill people you love. You don't steal from people you're thinking about, right? Let's get away from the external, the focus on the behavior in ourselves and in others. And let's turn our attention to our life, 
our inner life with God and the condition of that person before God because there's going to come a day when every individual the Bible is really clear about every individual is going to stand before God and give an accounting of themselves for everything they've said and everything they've done someday the heart's going to be exposed and we're going to have to give an accounting so it's probably best if we start now